Hello and welcome to this video where we will delve into the pagan Slavic interpretation of fate and fortune along with the mythical entities embodying these concepts. Among them is Rod, a prominent figure in modern Slavic paganism, often misinterpreted as a creator god and a deity of supreme rank. I will address the reasons behind these misconceptions and shed light on his true essence. But before we proceed, I would like to express my gratitude to all of my Patreon supporters. Your contributions are invaluable in sustaining this channel. And um, to the remaining people who are listening to this, if you're interested in joining the growing community of the World Tree and uh, accessing exclusive content, consider becoming a patron. One of the earliest information about pre-Christian Slavic beliefs comes to us from the Roman historian Procopius, who stated the following. For they believe that one God, the maker of the lightning, is alone Lord of all things, and they sacrifice to him cattle and all other victims. But as of fate they neither know it, nor do they in any way admit that it has any power among men, but whenever death stands close before them, either stricken with sickness or war, they make a promise that, if they escape, they will straight away make a sacrifice to the god in return for their life. And if they do escape, they sacrifice just what they have promised, and consider that their safety has been bought with the same sacrifice. This statement is often misinterpreted by some as suggesting that the Slavs lacked a belief in destiny, which is entirely false. The act of offering sacrifices to the storm god in times of misfortune clearly indicates that they revered a force above fate. By emphasizing the significance of the storm god, it is implied that destiny is irrelevant only in relation to this deity, the lord of all things. In reality, the Slavs were well aware of the concept of destiny, as evidenced by later historical sources from the Middle Ages and ethnographic accounts from modern times, uh, which uh, recount tales of mythical beings or deities determining the fate of individuals. Frequently, the fate of a person is determined by three women on the third night following the child's birth. These three women are known by various names in the diverse Slavic languages and uh, dialects, many of which can be traced back to three primary root words, one of which is rod, the meaning of which is kin, birth, origin, the second is sud, signifying fate or judgment. And the third is the verb nareti, meaning to call, to name, to foretell someone's fate. From these three roots, most of the Slavic local names for the fates are derived. For simplicity's sake, in this video, we shall refer to them as rožanici. The Rožanici can appear as three young and beautiful maidens or as three women of different ages. A young woman, an adult woman and an elderly woman who decide the fate and luck of newborn children. In folklore they appear wearing long white dresses, golden and silver jewelry or having their hair decorated with precious stones. They also wear white caps on their heads and hold burning candles or torches. They can sometimes appear as fairies or women uh, near a fairy lake or a well, spinning a thread or bleaching cloth. All of these attributes show that they are very similar to their other European mythological counterparts. According to Slavic belief, each of these sisters would proclaim the destiny of a newborn child. The eldest would state the most severe fate, the second a somewhat milder one, but the third had the final word and she would always proclaim the gentlest fate. This corresponds to the Norns from Old Norse myths, 
where the eldest is named Urder, meaning fate, the middle is Verdandi, to become or present, and the youngest is Skuld, meaning obligation, sharing the same etymology with the English word should, referring to that which should become or that needs to occur. Therefore, just like in the Slavic belief, their names signify the same relationship where it is the judgment of the third, often the youngest, that ultimately prevails. However, in this video, our focus is not on the Rožanici, but rather on their male counterpart, a figure unique to Slavic tradition as far as my knowledge extends. He is known by two different names, Rod among the Russians and Eastern Slavs, and Usud among the Serbs and Southern Slavs, with local variations. Rod means kin, while Usud means fate or judgment. Old Russian sources indicate that Rod appears at the birth of a child alongside the Rožanici. Two tables were set for them, one for the Rožanici and the other for Rod, each adorned with various offerings of food and drink. This is evident from the Sermon of a Lover of Christ, which condemns the practice, mentioning that the offerings made for Rod and the Rožanici were provoking God's anger. He is also mentioned in several other late medieval Christian sources, always in conjunction with the Rožanici. However, one particularly interesting source sheds light on some of his functions. It is a handwritten commentary on the Gospel from the 15th century and it states the following. So, not Rod sitting in the air and throwing clumps to the earth from which children are born. The creator of all is God, not Rod. This source led the Soviet author Boris Rybakov to conclude that Rod was once the highest god of all Slavic people. Although the word Rod, meaning kin, birth, origin, family or yield, can be found in all Slavic languages, references to Rod as a mythological being can only be found in late medieval Russian sources which condemn leaving offerings to him among other beings and deities. Since there are no records of Rod among other Slavic people, it is impossible to support Rybakov's claim that uh, he was the original highest Slavic god, later replaced by Perun. Nevertheless, uh, Rybakov's claims have gained traction, especially with the rise of the internet and various New Age interpretations. So consequently, Rod is now perceived by many as the highest Slavic creator god, similar to a monotheistic deity. Various creation myths attributed to him can be found online, none of which has any real basis for existence and are purely modern inventions. However, there is another intriguing aspect worth noting. It seems that the Slavs may have believed that Rod sits in the air, perhaps on a cloud, and throws clumps onto the earth from which children were born. The preacher in the source denies this concept, which he possibly heard from the pagans. This notion is interesting because a similar concept exists um, in Ukrainian folklore from the 19th century. In these tales, the answer to the question where do children come from involves a story where Eve, due to her influence over Adam, was cursed by God to bear children in pain on earth. After her death, she had to carry as many eggs as the number of people who died each day, transporting them to heaven. There God would uh, cut these eggs in two halves, throwing them to the ground. A boy would be born from one half and a girl from the other, eventually marrying each other. However, 
If one half of the egg fell into the sea or was consumed by an animal, the person from the remaining half would be left without a pair and wandering through life as a maiden or a farmhand. Could it be that in this narrative the Christian God assumed the role of Rod, throwing unidentified clumps from the sky containing people's spirits from which they are born? This imagery seems closely linked to the concept of destiny as those born from the split clumps or eggs were destined to either find their counterpart or wander alone aimlessly. Interestingly, this text does not refer to any mythical times when man was originally created, but rather tries to uh, convey the idea of how the world functions on an everyday basis in today's times. That is, how new human souls are actually created. We can compare this tradition, for example, with the Greek story of Deucalion, who, after the flood, threw the bones of Mother Earth, which are stones, onto the earth from which humans were born. In Greek mythology, we also know the story of the origin of the Athenians. One version of this myth states that Hephaestus desired the goddess Athena and tried to violate her but he ejaculated on her thigh. Athena then wiped his semen from her skin with a, a thuft of wool, which she threw on the ground. The contact of divine semen on wool with the earth gave rise to the ancestor and first human king of all Athenians, considered a descendant of the eternally virgin goddess Athena. This raises the question, what exactly are the clumps that Rod is depicted as throwing to the ground? In the Russian text, the word used for clumps is grudy, leading readers to naturally assume it refers to clumps of earth. However, it seems paradoxical to throw earth onto the earth itself. On the contrary, a clump or gruda could signify a heap of anything, maybe a heap of spirits or maybe stones. Considering this, isn't it more plausible to interpret these clumps as a symbol of Rod's genetic material? Could they represent his semen, symbolizing the act of fertilizing the earth when thrown down? This interpretation suggests a symbolic act of creation, uh, where Rod's essence contributes to the fertility and growth of the earth, akin to a divine seeding of life. Relying on this interpretation and considering the description of Rod as sitting in the air, some scholars have claimed that he represented the original sky, uh, Slavic sky father. However, this assertion seems improbable given that he only appears in late medieval Russian sources and is notably absent from the pantheon of Prince Vladimir from Kiev. Moreover, the authenticity of this text as representing genuine pre-Christian Slavic beliefs remains uncertain, as it could have been influenced by later religious and folkloric developments. On the other hand, some scholars interpret Rod as the original form of the protective household spirits known by various names in Slavic languages. I have explored this topic in depth in a video called The Cult of Slavic Grandfathers, which I highly recommend watching for a deeper understanding of the Slavic household ancestral cult. Despite the uncertainty surrounding Rod's primary function, several key points emerge. He cannot be simply characterized as a common Slavic sky god due to his late appearance in Russian sources. His role in the creation of people remains ambiguous and requires further investigation. Claims portraying him as a creator god responsible for mankind, nature or the universe 
lack substantial support from available sources. He was undeniably linked to the ancestral cult as implied by his name and his close association with the Rožanici who determined the fate of newborns. In Slavic languages, the Greek terms for luck and destiny are sometimes translated as Rod and Rožanica, therefore clearly showing that Rod is a synonym for fate in the same way that the South Slavic Usud is. Personally, I hold the belief that the Rod and the Rožanici symbolize the collective family luck and destiny akin to the concept of a Roman family genius as well as an individual luck and destiny. I also maintain that their cult is inseparable from the ancestral cult and uh, intertwined with that of the household spirit. Rod embodies the paternal ancestors and represents the essence of family kinship, symbolizing spiritual continuity through the generations, whereas the Rojanici embody the female ancestors. This association is particularly pronounced in certain South Slavic regions, where the eldest woman of the family assumes the role on the third night when the Rojanici are expected. And so, through a series of rituals, it is she, assuming their role, who bestows the fate of the child. As we have observed, in the Eastern Slavic region, there was a distinct cult dedicated to Rod and the Rožanici, whereas in the South Slavic regions we encounter, through the sources and the uh, ethnographic material, only the cult of the Rožanici. Offerings were made to them on the third night after the child was born. Just as the Eastern Slavic Rod serves as the male counterpart for the Rožanici, Usud emerges as the male counterpart of the South Slavic Sujaye, who are the Fates. In regions, South Slavic regions, where the Fates are referred to by other names, such as Narechnici, he is known as Narechnik, which is a masculine form. In other regions where they are referred to as Orisnice, he is known as Uris. This is all the same entity, a male counterpart of the three fates. Usud appears in several Serbian folk tales that vividly outline his functions. In one tale, both the Sujenice, that is the fates, and Usud convene to decide the fate of a child they cannot agree upon. In another narrative, he manifests as an elderly man dwelling at the edge of the world beyond the river, in surroundings that alter daily, ranging from a humble old man inhabiting a cabin to a prosperous landowner residing in a palace. Depending on the circumstances of the day, he distributes fortune to those born then by pouring golden, silver or copper coins from his chest, accompanied by the magical declaration As to me today, so to you forever. Before Usud performs this act each time, a loud thunder occurs, followed by a voice disclosing to Usud the number of individuals born on that day. This detail is particularly interesting when considered alongside Procopius's assertion that the storm god transcends fate, emphasizing that Usud or Rod did not hold the position of a supreme deity. This tale recounts the story of two brothers, one hardworking yet unfortunate and poor, and the other lazy yet fortunate and wealthy. The hard-working brother encounters a beautiful maiden spinning golden thread, who reveals herself as the fortune of his brother, bestowed upon him by Usud. In his quest for his own fortune, the poor brother encounters an old hag sleeping beneath a bush, who discloses that she is his fortune, or rather misfortune, granted to him by Usud. 
Eventually, he arrives at Usud's abode and learns how Usud dispenses fortune and misfortune. Understanding that he was born on an extremely unlucky day, he simply accepts his fate. But because he was hardworking and just, Usud advises him to adopt his niece, who was born on a fortunate day, and attribute everything he acquires to her. We can therefore observe that while the three fates primarily determine an individual's life expectancy, it is Usud or Rod who bestows fortune or misfortune often embodied in female form. Additionally, we learn uh, from this tale that although one's fortune is determined by Usud, it can be altered through righteous actions. This is further illustrated by two other instances in the same tale. During his journey to visit Usud, the man stays in two households where the hosts request him to pose questions to Usud in order to improve their fortunes. The first man faced difficulties with his cattle, which were not multiplying. Usud advised him to sacrifice the best bull when celebrating the day of his family patron saint, an originally pagan ritual honoring the household ancestral spirit. Following Usud's counsel, the man made the sacrifice, resulting in the multiplication of his cattle. The second man encountered challenges as his aging parents showed no signs of passing away and his family remained hungry despite consuming a whole cauldron of food per meal. In response, he concealed his elderly parents behind the fireplace and fed them only the leftover bones from meals. Usud advised him to honor and respect his parents by allowing them the main seat at the table and serving them the first cup of wine and brandy. He followed Usud's advice, leading to his parents' passing the following day and his family returning to consuming normal portions of food. These remarkable examples highlight the significance of proper sacrifice and reverence for our ancestors, emphasizing how pivotal these actions are for shaping our fortunes. Fate is thus portrayed as predetermined yet not unchangeable, as evidenced by numerous divinations attempting to ascertain the destiny's course as well as sorcery aimed at altering it. While individuals hold the threads of life and can influence them through various actions, destiny is also influenced by the circumstances of one's birth, but most significantly by the judgments of Rod and the Rojanity. Hopefully this video will clarify some misunderstandings regarding Rod as a creator god of the highest rank and shed light on his true nature. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing and supporting the channel by becoming an honorary patron of the World Tree. Similarly, if you wish to learn more, you can explore my books through the links provided below. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing and supporting the channel by becoming an honorary patron of the World Tree. Similarly, if you wish to learn more, you can explore my books through the links provided below. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.